Do you remember being a kid and viewing adults as having all of the answers? Well, in this video, I'm going to talk about three things that we were all told the wrong answers to growing up. Now, in this video, I'm going to start off by saying the answer that everyone always gave us and then follow that by the actual explanation of how this thing works. But before I explain it, I want you to try to answer it for yourself or ask your friends the answer. So let's get started with question number one. Why is the sky blue? I'm sure everyone's either asked this question or been asked this question at least once in their life. And I think we all probably said the exact same answer. So the answer that we always got as kids is that the sky is blue because the earth is over 70% water, the water is blue, and the color of the sky is just a reflection of the earth's water down. Now because the earth is 70% water, that means that it stretches over long distances, which is why in places such as the desert, the sky still looks blue even though there's no water. So in that explanation, they're saying that the sky is basically one big mirror that reflects. Now based on the title of the video, I'm sure you can deduce that that's not actually the reason. The reason the sky is actually blue is because of a process called Rayleigh scattering. Now Rayleigh scattering works by photons coming in from the sun and scattering off of air molecules. When these photons hit the air molecules, they scatter in all different directions emitting every wavelength of the visible spectrum. Now these wavelengths range from blue to red, red being the longer wavelengths and blue being the very, very short. Blue wavelengths are about one and a half times shorter than red. Now because the wavelength is shorter, that means that by definition the frequency of light is a lot higher. So when the light comes in and bombards these air molecules with photons, more blue light is going to be scattered because of the higher frequency of, of it being hit. Now because air molecules are a thousand times smaller than the wavelength of visible light, that means roughly four times as much blue light is being scattered than red light. Now Rayleigh has an equation that shows how much of the scattering actually takes place, and it's proportional to one over the wavelength to the fourth power. So that means that the smaller the wavelength, the larger the scattering. And since blue light has such a smaller wavelength than red light, it scatters way more. Now because it's a pretty large angle that the sunlight has to go to to reach us during the sunset because it's on the horizon, most of the blue and violet wavelengths that are being scattered off of those air molecules have already been scattered. Since red light has such a lower frequency, it can make it larger distance without being scattered away. That's why during the sunset, that's the only thing that we see is a red overcast. Now there's other contributing factors that help us see the specific shades of blue that we do, such as the different cones in our retina that help us distinguish between different colors of light. But when your kid asks, why is the sky blue next time, it's time to break out your Griffith's quantum mechanics book and start teaching them some Rayleigh scattering. Number two, why are you safe in a car during a thunderstorm? When I was a kid, I was told that we're safe during a thunderstorm in a car because the rubber tires keep us grounded. It helps the electricity from passing right through us. This is due to the rubber tires acting as an insulator. The correct answer as to why we're safe in a car during an electrical storm is because the car acts as what's called a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is something that exploits the principle that all of the charge lies on the surface of a conductor. Now mathematically what that comes out to is this equation here, which says that the electric field coming from a point is proportional to the charge density. Now when lightning comes crashing down, it comes down with an equivalent current of about 30,000 amps which corresponds to about 100 million volts. Now if you have 30,000 amps coming down from four miles in the sky, what is two feet of rubber going to do? It's not gonna do much, and that's why the rubber tire thing just does not make sense. Now Faraday cages are nothing new, and we still use them to this day. In fact, in the early 2000s when cell phones first started coming out, the reason you would lose your signal when you went into an elevator is because the elevator acted as a, as a Faraday cage. The elevator made it so that all of the signal, all of the electric field, lied on the surface of the doors. Therefore, no signal could penetrate it and reach your phone to give you any signal. So how are you guys doing so far? Have you gotten both of those right? If not, here's a chance to redeem yourself with question three. Why is winter cold? That seems like a pretty dumb question. But again, based on the title of the video, I think you might be in for a surprise. I'm gonna go out there on a limb and say that most people think that the winter is cold because it's the point where the Earth is farthest away from the sun. What if I told you 
that during the winter time is actually when the Earth is closest to the Sun. That's a very bizarre statement. Now during the winter solstice, which is around January 3rd, the Earth is about 91.4 million miles away from the Sun. And during the summer solstice, around July 4th, the Earth is about 94.5 million miles away from the Sun. Now this only leaves us a difference of 3.1 million miles. Now technically this means that during the winter time, the Earth is closer to the Sun than during the summer time. So what tools does that leave us with to explain why it's so much colder during the winter than the summer if that difference in distance is only about 3 million miles? Now the answer has everything to do with the angle at which the sunlight hits the Earth. A lot of people know that the Earth processes around its axis at an angle of about 23.5 degrees. What this corresponds to is that during the summertime, the sunlight typically hits the northern hemisphere at roughly 90 degrees. And during the winter time, it hits the northern hemisphere at exactly not 90 degrees. <laughs> now, how much warmer an object gets depends on the intensity of the light that's hitting it, right? The amount of light that actually hits the object is reduced by the sign of the angle at which the light is shining. So if the sunlight is striking the Earth at around 90 degrees, then no light is lost and we can still all get tan. But as you can see in this example, if we change that 90 degrees to a 30 degrees, we lose half of the total heat that we could have gotten. So if the Earth is closer to the sun during the winter time, then why isn't it warmer? Well, it's only a factor of 1 30th closer to the sun, and this is overwhelmed by the fact that potentially half of the light can be lost due to the sign of 30 degrees being a half. So those are three things that we were all told the wrong answer to as kids. How many of them did you get right? Regardless, I hope you enjoyed the video.